So I got a loan by Daibert. Daibert said, uh, I'm very happy if you fly my plane. So we all got up into a big wave. And the wave became so nasty that on the way we wanted first to go to Mount Whitney, 100 kilometers south, south, and to go from there in a wave flight to Boulder City. Mm -hmm. And I went to Mount Whitney and I thought that the wave was too nasty and very complex, tremendously turbulent. And I told them by radio, I won't go to Boulder City, I think it's too dangerous. And I wasn't sure that they got my message. But I got in a situation that you don't want to get in unless you see. You know how to fly like you, <laughs> namely that the cloud mass over the Sierra Nevada and the big rotor mass closed mm. while we were flying at 30,000 or so. Mm -hmm. We were suddenly in instrument flight. Yeah. I had no instrument rating. Yeah. I said, let's get out of here and get back to Bishop. So makes the story short. On the next day, we were all so tired, we didn't want to fly on the next day. On the next day, there was this beautiful wave. And I said, well, let's get our research gliders up. So Larry Edgar and Clee Force went up and went into the stratosphere at 44,000 feet. Uh -huh. That was the day. Yeah, that was the day. And if I had listened to them, then Larry called me down at the airport and said, go cross country today. And you know that I had prepared a cross country flight of 500 kilometers or 300. Mm -hmm. By looking at the data, we had spent much time to do that. And it was clear to me that even with such a old sailplane like the TG3, mm -hmm. you should be able to make a very long flight by using the consecutive mountain ranges that you could select. And I was so tired from the day before that I said, I'm not going to fly, I can't do that in the afternoon. I can still make it to Boulder City in the afternoon. So instead of starting in the morning, not knowing that I could have made the first thousand kilometer flight on this day, that had never been done before in gliding. Instead, I told Ray Parker, who was our chief pilot, you may remember him. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, very nice person. Yeah. I told him, can you not get a hose in here that can prevent the terrible icing I get on the inside of the of the windows. And he said, sure. But don't you want to fly? I said, I fly in the afternoon. That was a dumb decision I made. I flew in the afternoon. It was one of the worst toes I have done in my life. The tow plane not only put his wings vertically, but he just disappeared. Mm. He came up sideways for us. The cable came like a lasso flying towards us. Yeah. And we had five to six Gs in tow. Wow. And I looked down and there were no such, nothing but cactus. Of course, you want to release, but you could possibly land there. Yeah. So you had to stay on. But we had our experience with turbulent toes. And we knew that you don't follow the tow plane. If the tow plane disappears, 
Just wait a few seconds and you will go down in the same gust. Of course, he would go up by that time and his cable would come towards you. Or he might show up sideways of you. <laughs> but we had a lot of experience with that. But it was one of the nastiest too. And I just waited to enter the wave, which is so smooth. And I finally entered it. And that was the last gust that I had on this whole flight. The next gust I got was just before landing. And so I shot south along the Sierras to Mount Whitney and Lake, Owens Lake. And it's, it was completely smooth. So I didn't have to use my hands really. I used just my little finger. And this whole flight towards Mount Whitney, which was the highest mountain, or is the highest mountain in the US, uh, was just so easy. But it didn't count as distance because it was normal to the yeah, downstream. Yeah, yeah. And so I tried to make it pretty fast. And I lost my gloves and I said, I don't need them. I use just my little finger. Well, on this very long flight, long distance flight, I never had a gust anymore. It was all completely smooth. And it reminded me to what you were talking about today in the waves that you can get these long, smooth uh, pieces. But that was new to us. Now I had computed all the glide ratios, the winds, etc., well prepared. And I knew that even with the TG3 that had a glide ratio of 20 to 1, that I could make 30 to 1. Yeah. Maybe more. Even. Maybe more. Yeah. So I left and I wanted to arrive at Mount Whitney at 36,000 feet. And I got into an updraft of 10,000 feet a minute oh. and made it to Mount Whitney. Turned around and in the smooth air I went towards Death Valley to the Panamint Mountains mm -hmm. that were also 35,000 feet high, not 35,000, uh, 3,500 3, meters high. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I went there and as I approached them, they went started rising. And I got something like six feet a minute, six meters per second. Yeah. yeah. Six meters per second in this wave. And my my strategy was, which I had developed before, to climb up and use the height for course correction in the wave going sideways. Yeah, yeah whatever was needed. Yeah. And I could see where the next mountains were. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And I didn't lose any altitude, but was still climbing again. And I was over Death Valley and so on. Now came all kinds of small mountain ranges. Small meant 2,000 meter high, which was small compared to what we were used to. But they all had their field of updrafts mm -hmm. of nice mountain waves. They were lenticulars as far as I could see uh, to my right. Yeah. But in the flight direction they were no lenticulars. Uh -huh. But the wave was there. Uh -huh. And I could recover back to well, my start altitude that I had planned to do was 36,000 feet at Mount Whitney. And I had done that. I arrived precisely at 36,000. Mm -hmm. Now I had again 36,000 over this one. Mm -hmm. 
And it went on like that. It was so easy. It was wonderful. The only thing was I had lost my gloves again. It was a little cold, but I could see fairly good we had double windows. Mm-hmm.